Let's turn to the book of James, we chapter 3, having completed chapter 2 last Lord's Day. So we, in James chapter 3, and the first 12 verses, we'll read only the first five. We'll spend two weeks on this whole passage, uh, focusing our attention as an introduction, and the first five verses on uh, this passage. James chapter 3, let's read together verses 1 through 5. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. We've already observed, not once but more than once, how James, by the Holy Spirit, tends to jump from one subject to another. And we see the same thing here in the opening verse of James chapter 3, where he now is, is, appears to be addressing those who aspire to want to teach a completely new subject, it seems. And as we've seen before, what appears to be new and unconnected on close examination is very much connected to and linked to and bound up in what went before and what will follow. And this is also so helpful for the preacher because James introduces something and then he goes into it later. So if the preacher forgets something, he can revisit it at that next occasion. And we'll see James again return to the subject before us today later in the book. And so James maintains these various themes throughout his epistle here. So, in a sense, we prepared for his style. And when James says, boom, new subject, we know it's actually linked. They all weave together most beautifully as he opens this chapter. It's not primarily about the one who aspires to teach, although that is how he opens this book, but rather it's about the tongue. And it's about the judging that we saw in the previous chapter and showing partiality and correction and self-control, not only as by ministers, but by members of the church one to another. It's a warning regarding the power and the evils that lurk behind this powerful, very small member of the body that can control or cause you to lose control of the whole body, and that little member can steer the whole course of your life for good or for bad. Now, James, as I mentioned, and typical to his style, has already introduced the subject of the tongue and of controlling the tongue, which he now elaborates on in chapter 3. Go back with me, if you will, to that and to see the connection and understand the context so we can understand what the Holy Spirit is saying, not just right there in what we're reading, what is obvious, but its connection also to the previous verses, what this all means for the church. What does this mean as a member of the church of Jesus Christ? James chapter 1, back to that, verse 26. If anyone thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. His, this person's religion is worthless. True religion is not just a matter of talking or boasting. It's not mere professing, but it is doing. And we've seen this faith, in act, faith and actions working together as we observed last Lord's Day at the end of chapter 2. So even before he describes true religion there in chapter 1, 
He gives us this one great disqualifier. You religious? Yes. Can you bridle your tongue? It's worthless. Your religion is worthless if you cannot bridle your tongue. And then in chapter 2, in the first half, James deals with the sin of partiality. And again, it is the unbridled tongue that reveals the state of the heart being quick to speak, slow to listen, quick to become angry, and showing partiality to those who look rich and those who are important and famous to please men rather than please God. So to verse 3 and 4, chapter 2. If you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing, you say, sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It is with the tongue that we judge men. And it was, as we noted, in the judicial assemblies of the Jews, the example that he gives was expressed by those who are quick to speak and slow to listen, quick to become angry. And James has showed us how this applies in the church as we judge one another or as the elders judge a case in where cases are decided and censure or rebuke is passed. And this is the background of the context as James picks up the subject more fully in chapter 3. Warning the church that the man of God, the true Christian who's a hearer and a doer of the word, the man who has faith resulting in good works, those works working together to complete or to prove his faith, such a man of God in the church must be one that bridles his tongue, and he must be steered by the word of Christ in all that he says and what he does. So with that in mind, let's look at our text most closely, verses 1 through 5. Now there's more to say about this next week and about the next portion. James is repeating really the true religion requirement from chapter 1. If anyone thinks that he's religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. We're going to have two main points this afternoon. We'll spend most of our time on the second point uh, and there'll be a couple of sub-points and applications in that so, point number one, main point number one, the power and destruction of the unbridled tongue. Power and destruction of the unbridled tongue. We put bits into mouths of horses so that they obey us. We guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds and are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set on fire, set ablaze by such a small fire. And I was thinking about big fires, the big ship and the big horse, and I thought about America, a country where everything Big is always better. And coming here from South Africa, you're like overawed. You go to the grocery shop and there's not bread. There's about a hundred different breads to choose from. America is a huge country with huge amount of space, over 550 million people. And it's mostly the big things that are noticed and admired and a source of covenant, a covetousness in this great land of opportunity. Big income, big cars, big homes, big economy, big stock market, big sports, big noise. We can go on and on. Big was always better. And I remember I was still back in South Africa and the first cell phones came out. And they were the size and the weight of a brick. And then cell phones became smaller and smaller. And America decided... Big technology comes small, and so the cell phones, you could hardly hold them in your hand, let alone touch the buttons and those little flip phones and all these devices. And then came the smartphone, and things got bigger once again. James points out 
that a very small part of the body, a really small member, boasts great things like a fire that can start with just the smallest spark. And we know all about that in California, don't we? Hundreds and thousands, sometimes millions of acres destroyed by one idiot with a match. In our text, verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. No one take no, takes notice of your tongue. It's a forgotten and neglected member of your body until you burn it and it hurts like crazy. How big is your tongue? Huh? Is it sharp? Does, does your tongue taste well? Is that why you sing so well? Because of the shape of your tongue? No one says that. No one notices. Uh, some people put a ring in their tongue. And we say, why would that you do that? That doesn't adorn your body. We don't even see that ring. But James warns the leaders in the church, that in those who aspire to be leaders in the church and judge of the power and the destruction of that small member when it is unbridled. The reason, of course, is clear. That it is with our tongue, with our speech, and with our words that we express what is in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in our minds. It's not really the tongue. The tongue is just a little piece of flesh. It helps us to say those words. And given our remaining sin, even the believer must exercise great caution given the potential destructive nature of the tongue. And he's talking to believers, not unbelievers. As he says in verse 10, which we'll see next week, from the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, this ought not to be so. And it's our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, who taught that it is our mouths, those things that are so quick to speak, as James has warned us, that reveals what is really in our hearts. And he rebuked the Pharisees for that very thing. You remember Matthew 12 and 34, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? So in explaining the power potential destruction of the unbridled tongue, what that can inflict, James gives us these two examples of the importance of this Christian grace, the bridled tongue. The horse, the large big animal, and, and a large ship steered by a small rudder. Next, next week, Lord willing, we'll look a little more closely at the tongue and its potential evil uh, through verse 12, this fire, this world of unrighteousness that James calls it in the next section. So, as I said, James is repeating the true religion requirement from chapter 1 for the believer. If you think that you're religious, but you can't keep your mouth shut, or you can't say the right thing, you can't control and exercise self-control over your tongue. Your religion is worthless. The power and destruction of the unbridled tongue. And believers, I ask each one of you, we all look very good in our Sunday best, don't we? Do you like my tie today? And we all look good. What happens at home? Are our tongues bridled? When we speak to our spouses, when we become irritable, how is your tongue? Is it a means of destructive power, of breaking down, or is it a means used for good, for building up and bringing glory to God? And this brings us to our second main point. Secondly, the Christian grace of the controlled tongue. The Christian grace of the controlled tongue. Verse 1 and 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. If you know that we teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And he points out that our tongues is the main way that we stumble all the time. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, 
able also to bridle his whole body, insinuating that we are not perfect men, that even your pastors, all six of them, sometimes have unbridled tongues. All of us. Firstly, first sub-point, those who teach must control and guide their speech. And he's not talking to teachers, he's talking to those aspiring to teachers, but James very wisely, by putting in this phrase here, makes it clear that this is a message for those who teach, for the leaders, for the judges in the churches. James is addressing those who aspire to teach, but the message is for those who teach. They must control and guide the tongue. This instrument, we tame lions. I still wouldn't go up to a tame lion. Someone got mauled the other day, I saw. We, we can tame all kinds of beasts. No one has ever successfully been able to tame the tongue. Addressing the members of the growing churches. Remember, this is to the dispersion, to the dispersion, to the dispersed churches in the first century persecution. James makes a reference and a warning to those who are pastors and leaders in the church. It serves as a reminder to these ministers what they already know, that and that what they have been taught through the other epistles that at this time have been circulating. Namely, it is an awesome responsibility to teach and to preach the word of God, the whole counsel of God. In Paul's earliest writings and James's letters, you may remember from my introduction, were kind of on the same date, circulated at the same time. And in Paul's letters, he spends a great deal of time addressing pastors and teachers, especially in his later letters. And they will be judged more severely. And they must learn to bridle their tongues. Paul's letter to Timothy particularly emphasized the important qualities of the men appointed to preach and to teach the gospel. And that awesome responsibility that James has, not many of you, there are only few. And there's a reason that there are only few, because this is an awesome responsibility. And this is something that they are going to be held to a higher standard to than the rest of you. 2 Timothy 1.13, just two verses. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Jesus Christ. Because we tend to have unbridled tongues, follow the pattern. There's a pattern. Follow the words of the apostles. Follow the words of Christ. Follow the words of scriptures when you declare the truth of God. Do not let your tongue be unbridled. 2 Timothy 2.15, which we know so well, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, as a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly handling or dividing or opening up the word of truth. And James numbers himself among those men as a leader in the early church who will be judged more strictly. He's a godly and respected man we've seen in the first century whose letter to the dispersed primarily Jewish Christians bears witness to that. And he includes himself in this warning because James too and every minister in this church and minister of God is a sinner saved by grace. God's chosen method for the salvation of his people and the building up of the church is his declared word through the instrument of this tiny member. And that's why it's important that it is bridled. That member that no man has ever been able to tame and insinuates that no one has ever tamed it because then he'd be a perfect man. Consider verse 2 of our text, where James includes himself, says, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. Yes, your pastors stumble in what they say, just as you do. We are sometimes unbridled. And this is a reminder to all who teach, particularly pastors in the church, to be diligent in the word, to be faithful, to proclaim the whole counsel of God, and to hold firmly to the pattern of sound words 
the word of Christ and that pattern laid down by the apostles through the Holy Spirit. And above all, to bridle the tongue. Because it matters what you say, especially as a teacher. And as we see, the minister of the gospel will be held to a higher standard for his words. Pastors, teachers, in, in some sense, every parent is a teacher, isn't he, to your children. Let us be sure that true instruction is on our lips. Aspiring members, and there are a few men here, I see, who aspire to the work of the ministry, the oracles of God, and the burden of the scriptures is a heavy burden, and the work of the ministry must never be taken lightly. Not many of you should aspire to being teachers. It's more than a job, it's a calling. It's the call of God by the recognition of the church, and it comes with great responsibility and accountability. Remember in Malachi, of the covenant that God made with the priests. True instruction was on his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And incidentally, only Christ has done this perfectly. And he turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should God knowledge. And people should seek instruction from his mouth because he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. And then let's not forget the greater context in James, James's message, that of judging justly, that of becoming impartial based on any outward appearance or worldly status, of being attentive listeners and hearers first, becoming doers of the word, careful to bridle our tongues, for true faith is profession and practice. The minister's heart must always be filled with the word of Christ, guarding that knowledge carefully so that true instruction will come from his mouth because he's a messenger of the Lord of hosts. Those who teach, firstly, must control and guide their speech. And then secondly, the Christian. The Christian must control and guide his speech. In truth, all that we have said above is required by the believer. True religion is seen in this proof, not only for the minister and the judge and the leader, but for every child of God. If anyone thinks that he is religious but does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. He's self-deceived and his religion is worthless you may as well not come to church, James is basically saying. And as that bridle, that little steel piece with the leather that you hold on to when you get on this, I'm so afraid of horses, and you get on this great big beast, you can literally control this great big beast. Turn left, yeah, and he turns. You just pull the side and he turns. A couple other things you need to do with your feet and stuff, but that's a different story. The point is a good horseman can control a massive animal with just a bridle. And the smallest part, comparatively to this massive ocean liner, it's about this high. It's pretty big on a big ship. And I, there was a picture of some stowaways sitting on that rudder the other day in, in the papers, but that rudder can control the direction of the ship. So our words and our hearts, our words need to be guided and our hearts filled with the word of Christ, a true religion that loves God above all, desires to obey him, a true religion that shows itself in love and care for one another by the love and good deeds we spoke of, if these things fill our hearts, our speech will be bridled. Our speech will be correctly guided by the word of truth. Because Christ told us, out of the abundance of the heart, the heart is filled with love for God, brethren, then your works have to show it. Then your mouth and your speech must show it. And when it doesn't, you repent. And you confess your sin. 
Psalm 39 and verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways that I might not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. Pay attention to scripture, in other words. Hide his word in your hearts. You too, like the minister on the stricter level, will be held accountable for your words. Consider Proverbs chapter 5. Verse 1 and 2, a father to his son, my son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and that your lips might guard knowledge. And all these previous lessons of James are to be applied to that heart of grace, to season our mouths, to be quick to listen. Slow to speak, slow to become angry. Proverbs fifteen twenty five. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil things. And if you're one of those people like me who likes to just talk before he thinks, bridle your tongue. Matthew five eleven. It is not what goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of his mouth that defiles the person. Child of God, a true Christian must be the one who controls and guides his speech. For the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. And the renewed believer with his new nature must, and he will by the help of the Spirit through the word, bridle his tongue. Otherwise your religion is worthless. Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips, said the psalmist in Psalm 141 and verse 3. The leader and the Christian. This brings us to our third and final sub-point. Number three, the applications of the controlled and bridled tongue. What are the applications of the controlled tongue? And bridle tongue. How do we bridle our tongues as believers? What is the application in my life? How can I ensure that my speech is gracious, is seasoned with salt, as the scriptures do? What can I do as a believer to direct my speech and guide my life by that speech in the things that I say? That I will use my tongue to say my words. And I want to say, before we just look at a couple of examples of how we need to do these things, most importantly, ensure that you are in Christ. Ensure that you're in Christ. If you have not been born again by the Holy Spirit of God and believe in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, if you have never repented of your sins and received forgiveness of sins through the work and the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will not bridle your tongue. You can make a new res year's res resolution not to cuss so much or not to snap so much. I'll give you a week at the most. As the renewed believer, you need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need his forgiveness to fill your heart. If your heart is full of yourself, your thoughts are constantly sinful and impure, and you will not successfully bridle your tongue for it remains a wellspring of evil. You need Christ first. Come to him. Come to him, unbeliever. Don't try and do the work before you have the grace. It doesn't work that way. And believer, your remaining sin requires you to work at your sanctification. To confess your sins daily. To purify your conscience. Display what your heart is truly full of, that love of God which has been shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Spirit. So if you fill your heart with his word and the love for Christ and your brothers, you will bridle your tongue and you will guide your speech. So in closing, let's just consider four things Four ways by way of application to help us direct and guide our speech in order to bring glory 
to God. Four examples, and you need to take these and apply them to your own hearts in the way that are best for you. Improve on this sermon. Improve on this sermon by taking these things. And I'm going to call them A, B, C, and D because I have a lot of other points here. When tempted to criticize and break down, use your tongue for encouraging and building up. When tempted to criticize and break down, rather use your tongue to encourage and to build up. Use that bridle to curve your speech by self-control. Don't entertain your remaining sin, but display the new nature by sanctifying your speech. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come from your mouth, but only as such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That's the first. Secondly, B, when you are angry and bitter, when you're angry and bitter, and we all go there, we've all been there, use your tongue for confession and forgiveness. Use your tongue for confession and forgiveness. When angry at your own sin or hurt by others sinning against you, always be ready not to retaliate, but to forgive. You remember Pastor Sam Sermon? When someone comes forgiveness, you should have the bunch of flowers ready behind your back. Please will you forgive me? I've forgiven you already. I already have the flowers. Always confess your own sin, first to God and then to others. We know the beautiful passages. We claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And to others, don't be too humble to confess your sin to one another, especially if you're the offender. James says in chapter 5 and verse 16, I told you he's come back to this, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Prayer of a righteous man, person has great power in its working. And always be ready to forgive and to consider the greatness of God's forgiveness to you. I must forgive you again for that. This is habitual. This is a pattern. You don't deserve forgiveness. Then consider how God has acted toward you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is to reach down, deep down, into our new natures and to reject the remaining sin tainted with anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. Consider Colossians 3, and I love this passage. Put on then, clothe yourselves as God's chosen ones who are holy and beloved. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive one another. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. That peace that Pastor Sam spoke about, even when we are wronged, even when we are persecuted unjustly, we have the peace. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Thirdly, number C, when we need to correct or reprove a brother. And that also happens. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, whether it's a pastor or a church member, you may need to judge someone aright and reprove them as a believer and as a brother. 
correct and admonish carefully and in love. When you need to correct or prove, use your tongue to correct and admonish carefully and in love. Never lord it over or judge harshly. Thomas Manton says, temper reproof with tenderness. Temper your reproof with sweetness. Search your own heart before you judge that you are not guilty of the same sin. He says a censurous sin are more aggravated. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, Romans 12. Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Christians who judge and approve a brother or sister of sinful or unwise decisions in their lifestyle should exercise extreme caution to restore gently. Restoration is the only object of reproof. That's the only object, that they would be restored. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you also be tempted. Censures are full of passion, but Christian censures should be compassionate. Thomas Manton. Such is the difference in reproving out of pride and reproving out of love and charity. So rather look to your own heart first. Watch out for the sin of pride when you feel you ought to correct a brother or sister. Each man knows his own heart, but only God judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he will bring these things to light by his spirit through the word of Christ as it is preached and applied. You know the text, Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrows, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Fourthly and finally, D. When tempted to grumble against God because of trials and infirmities, and when discouraged by others, or yourself, use your tongue for worship and fellowship. Use your tongue above everything for worship and fellowship. Nothing shields the heart better than worship and thanksgiving when tempted to sin and grumble against God. Psalm 89 verse 1, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. That's the very opposite of Lord. We're going through a hard time right now. Lord, I'm infirm. Lord, this infirmity continues. Lord, this dark providence won't leave me. With my mouth I will proclaim. Shield your heart with worship and the fellowship of his people. Colossians 6, uh, 3, verse 16, 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Fill your heart with it, teaching and admonishing one another, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Thankfulness in your heart to God. Whatever you do in word or do, deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Psalm 109, verse 30, with my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the song, of the throng. Brothers and sisters, the last one, never neglect the means of grace on his day. It is our sanctuary. It is our rest from the storm. It is the feeding of the manna from heaven to strengthen our faith and to strengthen our calm, our soul. It is a cleansing of our robes that have been, become tainted from the world. It is sweet fellowship with one another and with Christ around his word 
and around his table, which we will do right now. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider then how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more until you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we confess that we fail you with our tongues, that with the same mouths we sometimes curse, and then we come to bless you. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Help us to put a muzzle on our mouths when we're in the presence of the wicked. Help us to fill our hearts with your love and with your word, to hide that word in our heart, to fill us with the joy of the Lord and help us by your spirit to bridle our tongues and to guide our thoughts and our thinking that in what we do and in what we say, we may bring glory to you. Lord, forgive us and strengthen us to be an example one to another, to be an example as the teacher, to be an example as the pupil, to be the example as the mother and the father and the child. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer, for we pray in Christ's name.